Let's begin reading at verse 46. I'll read verses 46 and 47 and get into our study. Uh, John chapter 8, beginning at verse 46, reading to verse 47. And Jesus says, Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear, because... You are not of God. And so in our last uh, study, I mentioned to you that I was going to pick up at this place here. And, and let me remind you of a few things. Jesus has been confronting some who have been listening to him. And I pointed out to you, if you look at verse 31, I, I point out that uh, John had identified them as Jews who believed him. And that's an interesting way to put it. Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. And so that's uh, basically who the conversation is as Jesus is speaking. That's who he is speaking with. So by saying that, John was pointing out that they'd shown an interest in him. It isn't that they were actually his disciples. They were people who had curiosity. And that's why Jesus made it clear that his disciples were those who remain or abide in his word. So that makes it obvious that curiosity alone doesn't constitute saving faith. There's a lot of people who have an interest in God. They have an interest in the Bible. You know, you can go to some colleges and you can actually take the Bible as literature. And there will be people there who will go and take that class because they see it as an interesting book. And there are those who want to know about God. There are those who speak and say, I'd like to know more about him. But that doesn't mean that they're willing to drop everything, pick up a cross and follow him. And that's basically what is taking place here. So John is making it clear that these whom he is speaking to right now are those who have shown an interest in him. They're not his disciples. They have curiosity. And again, that's why Jesus said his disciples are those who abide in or remain in his word. And as this is taking place in this chapter here, he went on to expose their lack of genuine faith by, by saying this to him. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Remember how they responded when Jesus made that statement that they got really upset at him. They, they, they responded immediately by saying, we've never been in bondage to anyone. And so Jesus was speaking to them about that because indeed, even as they were saying, we have never been in bondage to anyone, they were in bondage to Rome. And so this self-deception is what's being dealt with as Jesus is speaking to them. And so Jesus went on to say to them in verse 32 that he's the one who makes people completely free. Now, all of this is serving to reveal that these are not genuine disciples. You see, when Jesus spoke of complete freedom, true believers would have rejoiced. How did you respond when you actually grasped that message? How did you respond when you heard that you could be free completely? that all of your sins would be completely washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. I, I don't know what you responded like. I can tell you how I responded. I responded with amazement. I responded with this sense like, you're kidding me. I was only 20 years old. It's not like I was the worst sinner in the world. You know, I reserve that for John Mata. I wasn't the worst <laughs> sinner in the world, but I certainly was a, 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 a sinful young man. And, and laden with so much guilt and so much depression over the things that I'd done. Just heavy. And so when the gospel is preached to me and, and, and I am told that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses you from all sin, not just some sin or a few sins or particular sins, all sins, every single one, I was amazed. What were you like? I was amazed. It, can this be so? Can this be true? See, if, if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. And there should be a response in the heart of a person, a, a response that, that just you spend a lifetime just glorifying God for what he's done. You know, what, why do you serve God? Why, why do you serve God? I serve God because he set me free to do so. I serve God because he loved me. He gave his son for me. And the gratitude of my heart is overwhelming. I'm overwhelmed with gratitude for what Jesus did on the cross for me. Do I walk like that 24 hours a day, you know, every day? No, there are, 
there are my, my moments where I, I sometimes seem to forget what he's done. But the overwhelming reality is what Jesus is saying is, it, it, listen, he said, the son will set you free. And the one who set free is free completely, is free indeed. And again, those who were hearing this message should have rejoiced that the knowledge that they were no longer in bondage to sin ought to produce this great joy. The freedom given to us in our Savior brings such relief that we are overwhelmed by it. Remember when the angel was speaking to the shepherds who were approaching the Christmas season? You, you'll be hearing about this real soon. But remember how the angel told the shepherds on the night that Jesus was born, how the angel in Luke 2, verse 10 said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. I bring you good tidings of great joy, mega charis in the Greek, great, unbelievably great joy. Because that's what happens, guys, when you get right with the Lord. There's this joy. And so that's the response of somebody who's been totally forgiven, this amazing joy. Like it says in Romans 4, verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. The word blessed speaks of joy, rejoicing. The one who knows these things has joy in their heart. And, and if you're, you're, you're not walking in the joy of the Spirit, remembering that the joy of the Lord is your strength, maybe you need to just rehearse in your mind what God has forgiven you from and how grateful you can be. It, it, it has a way of restoring joy. It has a way of reminding you, look what God has done. We live in such a, a society that is so dissatisfied with what they have. We always want a little bit more, just a little bit more. Like that millionaire who was asked, uh, how much is enough? And he says, just a little more. We're, we're that way as a people. I want just a little bit more, more satisfaction, more whatever. You know what? God has already given to you more than you can even handle. We just don't realize it yet. And as you begin to walk in his spirit and you begin to see what God does, and when you begin to count your blessings, when you begin to think about what the Lord has done, you're just amazed. I can't help. I'm looking at my wife for a moment here, and I'm thinking it was in a November. She may not even remember this. It was a, a November that she gave her heart to Jesus Christ. And so for you, it's your anniversary, uh, 45 years of walking with Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. And, and, and I remember that. I remember that because she came to my Bible study hunting a husband and got me. <laughs> No, she didn't. Okay, these people should have had great joy, but instead, notice how they responded, anger and indignation. Verse 33, they claimed that they'd never been in bondage to anyone. So as we have seen, Jesus made it clear that even at that moment, they were in bondage. They were in bondage to sin. And that drove them to reject him and even revealed a desire in their heart to kill him. Now, they had claimed descent from Abraham, but Jesus makes it really clear, you're really children of the devil. Now, they, shows that, they show that by, by the rejection of his word and his desire, their desire to kill him. Notice verse 43, where he said, Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. He is a liar and the father of it. This is coming from the mouth of sweet and gentle Jesus. There's so many people that don't have the full concept of Jesus in terms of his teachings. And, uh, you know, sometimes we wonder how, 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 you know, how come people can be so pointed sometimes? How come... They can point out sin sometimes. Isn't that cruel? Isn't that judgmental? Look at the words of Christ here. Look how strongly he's speaking to these people. It isn't a lightweight thing that he's saying at all. He's telling them, you are children of Satan. That's what he's saying. And that's a pretty heavy thing. You're, you're, you're revealing your rejection by rejecting my word. And, and the real desire is not to follow me, Jesus is saying. Your real desire is to kill me. Remember, Satan was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. And he says, and you're like your father. He, he lied to Eve. He lied to Eve. When, when he said um, something related to the, the, the fruit in the garden, um, she, she speaks to him and she says, God has said to us that we shouldn't eat of this, neither should we touch it, lest 
lest we should die. And then Satan, first thing he says is, you shall not surely die. He's a liar from the beginning, from the very beginning. And it was, uh, it was Satan who provoked and encouraged Cain to rise up and to, to kill his brother Abel. So he's not only a liar, but he's also a murderer. In 1 John 3, 11 and 12, John says it like this. He said, this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. And so Jesus is saying, you are of your father, a liar and a murderer. And why do they refuse to believe him? He says it because he said, I tell you the truth. And you, you love the lie. As I've mentioned to you before, I, I say this fairly often enough to try and make that point indelible in our souls. The fact is when, when you tell someone the truth, they don't always love you for doing so, do they? They don't always love you for doing so. One of the first things you hear today is, why are you judging me? Why are you judging me? You know, they don't always thank you for pointing something out, even if you do it with tears and a broken heart. And you can actually alienate them for telling them the truth. And that's, that's, that was the case with Jesus. And that's, the, that's something that uh, the Lord taught me as a minister of the gospel a long time ago. As a matter of fact, Galatians 4.16 became a very important scripture to me very early in my walk with the Lord. Where, where Paul said to the church of Galatia, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Because people would prefer a lie over the truth very often, and that's just a fact. And so as that goes on, verse 46, he asks the question, which of you convicts me of sin? Well, they couldn't convict him of sin, but they still rejected him. Now, Think about that for a moment. When Jesus asks the question, which of you convicts me of sin? If, if, if you said that in your home, if you were just sitting there on Thanksgiving and, uh, you know, could you pass the mashed potatoes? Could I have some corn, please? And, oh, by the way, which of you can convict me of sin? <laughs> Forget about it. That's the end of Thanksgiving meal for you. Where do you want me to begin? You know, this, this, this. Hey, all of us are that way. But think about it. Think about Jesus. I mean, Jesus is raised. I mean, he must have been an unusual brother to have anyway, because the scripture tells us he had brothers and sisters. He must have been unusual. Think about it. How would you like to be raised in the home with a perfect kid? I mean, Mary never even had to tell him, make your bed. He just couldn't know. Mary, he never lied. He never did anything anything never got a lecture never got in trouble really you know he did get one lecture uh, now that I recall when and he had remained behind in Jerusalem uh, during the feast and and Mary and Joseph had gone and they had to turn around and come back and then Mary was upset with him and she said to him your father and I am you know looking for you and and Jesus rebuked her for that because he had done nothing wrong. I'm, a, I'm about my father's business. When you speak of my father, it's not Joseph. My father's God. And so Jesus even rebuked his mother in a mild way, but it was a rebuke nonetheless, because she tried to lecture him once. It's in Scripture. And, and well, a second time, I know I'm thinking about Mary. I didn't prepare this, but I'm thinking about it again. You know, when John do, they have no wine. Well, well, what's that got to do with me? You know, thank you, Jesus. Teach me to disrespect. No. And he's saying, you are not the one who gives me the, the timetable of my activity. My father is. I'm not under your orders. I'm under his. And so you'll see those rebukes even to his mother because she tries sometimes to insinuate herself into his life. But even so, who could, who could say Jesus sinned? And he could say that in front of everybody. Imagine that. Everybody. Everybody. And, you know, he who is without sin, let him be the first to cast a stone at this woman, he had said. He's the only one who could have done that. And he didn't because Jesus Christ is perfect. And so we ask that question in verse 46, which of you convicts me of sin? Verse 47, he who is of God hears God's words. That word hear 
in the original language, the New Testament was written in the Greek language. It's called Koine Greek. Koine Greek speaks of the language of, of the average person at that time. It was just the language that, that they spoke, common Greek. And it says, he who is of God hears. So I looked up that word here. I wanted to know what word was used for that translation. And that word that is used speaks of understands. When Jesus said, he who is of God hears God's words, the literal word would be understands or gives heed to. And so a person who knows the Lord values what God has to say. And when that person values what God has to say, they're listening with an inclination to obey. It's like what it says in Jeremiah 15, 16, where Jeremiah the prophet said, your words were found and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Your words were found and I ate them. They were sweet to the taste, pleasant to me. I desire them greatly. I hunger for your word. I desire your word. And, and that's what Jeremiah was saying. It's like what Psalm 119, 103 says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. You know, and it, it's our desire to do those things that are pleasing to the Lord, to desire, like Job said, his word more than our, than our daily food. And so if you have a relationship with God, you don't avoid his word, you desire his word. And when you read his word, you don't argue with it. There are quite a number of believers I encounter on a regular basis who like to argue with God. And they say, oh, I never argue with God. Oh, but we do. We do when we're reading the scripture and begin to debate whether or not we'll do that, whether or not we're willing to do that. Sometimes you'll read your Bible and you say, well, that's very convicting. I, I'm reading the wrong, you know, that's really not to me. That's to my wife. I, I wish she was in here right now so I could show her what God is saying to her. You know, we have this tendency of wanting to kind of like push it off on other people. The things that he says that are pleasant to us to hear are the things that we will grab hold of and want to hear. The things that cut to our heart or convict us of sin are the ones we're uncomfortable with. And so one of the ways for us to discover if we really have a relationship with the Lord is how hungry are we for him and how hungry are we for his word. And Jesus is making it very clear that the one who is of God hears God's word. He says in verse 47, you do not hear because you're not of God. Now that is a very strong statement. Uh, I use various commentators when I prepare my studies and one of the commentators name is Ellicott and he said this, he said rabbis and priests, teachers of the law, judges of truth, offerers of sacrifice, keepers of feasts, worshipers in synagogues and the temple. They were all these things, but Jesus made it clear they weren't of God. They were very religious, went to temple, made their sacrifices, did all of these things. Is it possible for a person to do all these religious things and not have a relationship with God? And some in this room would say, absolutely because you did that, because you went to your catechism classes, because you went to church regularly, because you received whatever kinds of, um, of um, identifications of your church. I did. I, I can speak as a Catholic. I, I, I can say that I received baptism. I can say that I had the sacrament of confession and penance and uh, first communion and, and uh, you know, confirmation. And, and all of those things, if you were to look at it on paper, um, I, I would have been regarded as, you know, a, a good Catholic boy. But none of those things made me any different. You know, my mom took me to a small church. Many of you are aware of this church. It's in Alvera Street. It's, it's a little church there in Alvera Street. When I was uh, in December, I would have been four months old at the time. My mom told me the story. She said, I went to the the little church there in Alvera Street. She says, I found a priest and uh, and there's a little alcove. I've been in the church, perhaps some of you. It's, it's an old church in LA. And you go in there and there's this little alcove and it's got the little baptismal there. And that's where my mom at the age of uh, 20 took me and had me baptized in that little place. You know, so 
my heritage religiously started when I was four months old. And my family, I have an uncle who's long been dead, who was, uh, a, I believe as he, if he was an archdeacon or, or a bishop, he was very high in the Catholic Church in Jalisco. And he actually came from Jalisco to California to baptize my eldest aunt because she was born in Mexico and he was our he was he would have been a great uncle to me. So our religious history was steeped in Catholicism. That was my background. So I was baptized. I received communion. I received confirmation and all of that. I did those things. And had you argued with me or discussed with me religion because I'd gone to catechism and I knew the rudiments of of my own quote unquote faith, I was able to argue those points because I memorized them at the age of seven or eight years old. But I didn't want to hear God's word. I wasn't hungry for them. I didn't want to hear people preach to me about how to live or what to do. I refused those things because that's what a person who professes religion is all about. They don't have a real relationship. They just hide themselves in regulations and hope that those things are going to make them good in the day that they stand before God. Jesus is speaking to people who have all of those things, who've done so many things. Again, the, the rabbis, the priests, the teachers of the law, judges of truth, their offerers of sacrifice, keepers of feasts, worshipers in synagogues, worshipers in the temple. They were all of those things. And yet Jesus is saying, you are not of God. They could hear but they refused to act upon. They heard, but they failed to give heed to his words. And so, verse 48, the Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And Jesus answered and said, shut your mouth. No, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father. and You dishonor me. Now, when it says, and I want you to notice this, the Jews answered and said in verse 48, do we not rightly, or do we not say rightly that you're a Samaritan? This is the only place that this is actually found, this statement here, but it was common knowledge at that time that that is what they were saying. So they call him first a Samaritan. Now, when they called him a Samaritan, when they say, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan? You need to remember something we've already looked at, and I'll touch on it lightly. The Samaritans and Jews had nothing to do with one another because the Samaritans were what would have been referred to as a hybrid race, meaning that the Assyrians had brought in people who had been conquered by Assyrians and brought them into the, Samar the area of Samaria. When you think of the map of Israel, think of the map of California because Israel is a West Coast kind of uh, country. So picture it, it's similar uh, in configuration to California. So you have Northern California, Central California, and you have Southern California. Well, the north of California, uh, the north of Israel is, is called the Galilee. The center, which would be Central California for us, the center is Samaria, and then the southern would be Judah. And so what they did is they brought people from foreign lands and populated the, the area that is referred to as Samaria with people who brought in their false gods. And so over time, what happened is the false gods that they had brought in with them, their faith in and practice of worship of these false gods began to be intermingled with the Jewish faith. And the Jews very early began to regard Samaritans as pagans and had no dealings with them. And that's why when a Jew would travel from the south to the north or from the north to the south, they would normally cross over the Jordan to their east and would travel south or go north, but first traveling across the Jordan, then go up, bypassing Samaria, and then coming back in and going to whatever destination they were going to. The Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. So to be referred to as a Samaritan was a very terrible kind of a, of a slam, if you will. It was a slur. So it's interesting in spite of this, I wanted to touch on a couple of things that I didn't touch on last time. It's worthy of note that the Samaritans are mentioned a few times in the Gospels. We've seen them already in John's Gospel, for example, the Samaritan, when we looked at the woman at the well, which was 
We were told that this woman was a woman of Samaria. So the Samaritans have already been introduced to us. When you look into the Gospel of Luke, Luke records how Jesus went through a village and was approached by 10 lepers. Raul used to call them leopards. 10 lepers. And remember how these lepers had approached and, and asked for mercy. And Jesus had cleansed them of their leprosy. It's recorded in Luke 17 because it says in Luke 17 verses 15 and 16, uh, after they had been cleansed, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And then Luke adds these words, and he was a Samaritan. There were 10, nine of them were Jews, one was a Samaritan. And yet Jesus says, were there not 10 of you cleansed? And yet only one came back to give thanks and praise. And they're pointing out one, the Samaritan woman at the well. Two, you have this cleansed leper who was Samaritan. It's given us an insight into some things about the Samaritans. And then once again, all of us know the story of the good Samaritan. And so, so that, that good Samaritan is recorded in Luke chapter, chapter 10. But in the midst of all of this where somebody falls among thieves and they beat him, left him on the side of the road, and a priest and a Levite came by, Jesus made sure to point out that they stepped across the street, walked around him, and then here comes a Samaritan. And the Samaritan ministers to him and all. So this compassion that he had was pointed out by Jesus. So what he was doing was exposing the religious hypocrisy of the Jewish religious leaders. So when they're saying to Jesus, are we not speaking the truth when we call you a Samaritan? It's interesting to see how the Samaritans really show up in the New Testament as not being as evil as these people here are claiming them to be. What they were is people in need of the gospel. And so Jesus ministered to them. They also say that he's in league with and empowered by Satan. Do we not say rightly that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? A demon. Well, this is an accusation they had cast at him. Luke eleven eighteen 18 says, If Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. So once again, what they're doing here is they're not dealing with, and this is an important point, and I want to make this very clear as I say this. This is a very important point that I want to make here. Um, I want you to notice something in all of this. They are not arguing against the Lord Jesus Christ's message. What they choose to do is attack him as a person. And that's called an ad hominem argument. If you can't beat a person on the strength of your arguments in contrast to theirs, just attack them. Just call them a name. Try and make them look as bad as possible. Tie some very negative thing that has occurred tie it into their character. And people will stop stop uh, taking into consideration the strength of argument, and what they will do is they'll just attack the person. That is so common. It's one of the things I learned about ad hominem arguments when I was in elementary school. It is a very common thing to not deal with the argument, just attack the person. And that's what they're doing here. They're attacking him. They're not listening to the words he's saying. He said you can't hear them. They're ignoring the things he's saying because they are so bent on destroying him, they can't hear a word that he's saying. So he says in verse 49, I do not have a demon. I honor my father and you dishonor me. So Jesus ignores the charge that he's a Samaritan, denies that he's demonized. He's being attacked and his response is to give, his response actually gives us insight in, into how we should respond. He dealt with the attack clearly, and he rebutted their unjust statements. Um, over the years, it, it, it depends on how long you, you live, you're going to have this happen more than once. You will have people who will attack you. I guess every one of us in this room have had that more than once in a lifetime, maybe many times. You know, if you're in ministry, that's a very common thing. 
for people to, you know, to attack you and, and that you become aware of those things. I was speaking to my pastor, Chuck Smith, one time, a long time ago now, and I, I said to Chuck something like, Pastor, I said, you, you've been around for a long time and God has used you in great ways. Um, but I have to ask you a question. I said to Chuck, I said, do you, uh, do, were you born with a naturally thick skin or did you develop one over time? I wanted to know because he received so many attacks. I mean, I can still remember uh, there, there's so many. I mean, he introduced uh, Maranatha Christ, Christian music. The music that we're used to here was unheard of. Some of you may be old enough to remember that. You didn't have guitars on an altar or a stage they called it the altar. You'd, you didn't have guitars. You didn't have drums. Uh, as I mentioned recently, there were, there were articles that were written uh, about Calvary Chapel introducing what they called voodoo music. Voodoo music. Uh, that's so crazy. You can't believe it. But that's the truth. You know, these hippies who have come in and have introduced pagan rites. That was resurrected when Chuck died. Sad to say, somebody that I admire very much, a man by the name of John MacArthur, resurrected that when Chuck died and said that we were uh, offering a, an unholy, profane fire and that, that it was the hippies through the Calvary Chapel that has been the reason that the church is, is, is in a bad place now. John said something to that effect, and I felt sorry that he had done that because I've admired him for many years. I respect him highly and for him to take that route. But that, that was common. We heard that many times, many times. Chuck Smith is a simple-minded preacher and he just gives simple sermons to simple-minded students. You know, Pastor Chuck had a photographic memory. I have a photographic memory. Problem is the film never develops, but he had, he had, a, photo, he had a photographic memory. You know, and he could read something one time. I've been with him many times where he would hold this Bible. I'm thinking right now when we were in uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and I was sitting there with him and my dad as he was giving a message, and he had his Bible, and he always held it closed on his lap. And he quoted verse by verse, word for word, chapters 5, 6, and 7 out of the Gospel of Matthew. He was not a simple-minded man by any means. He's a man who was going to be a doctor, and he had the brains for it, and he loved science. But God called him to minister, and he took that magnificent mind of his and put it into the Word, and that's why we today, to this day, I am blessed by his ministry for what he did. And yet, the accusation was against him, and then later on, it's been against us. People like myself and Rawl and so many guys. You guys are simple-minded guys who give simple Bible studies. But Chuck said, I would rather speak a few words that are easy to understand than 10,000 words that people can't understand. And I remember when my dad first got saved, how I was sitting inside a Bible study in, in, in 1973. My dad was one of the people sitting in the Bible study, just a handful of people. And I still remember using a word. I still remember the word I used as I was teaching, tetragrammaton. And I was speaking, and I said, you know, that's the tetragrammaton. The tetragrammaton is, is the name of Jehovah, J-H-V-H, and the tetragrammaton. And my dad just looked at me, and he was beaming with this big smile in his face when I said tetragrammaton. And I was using my college vocabulary, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart. I've never forgotten this. And he said, your father is so proud of you, but doesn't understand a word you're saying. I've never forgotten that it was true because I was using words. My dad had an eighth grade education. He was proud of his son. He wasn't a stupid man. My dad was very intelligent. But at the age of 13, during his day, he had to quit school so he could go out to the fields and work. That's what my dad and all my uncles did. That was common at that time. They didn't all graduate. My dad didn't. He read the Reader's Digest every night. That was his book. But dad didn't know big words. And there he is smiling at me as I'm using them. And I'm thinking, yeah, this college vocabulary comes in handy. And the spirit says, she doesn't understand what you're saying. And that's what I began to learn. Not that like, not like uh, I'm so superior. Forgive me if it sounds that way. But that's when I began to learn that 
that, that you, you can have many words that are not understandable. So for you who are teachers, always remember that a child in the room should understand what you're saying. They should be able to grab what you're saying. It has to be that plain, not because you're less or greater, not because that's how it is. And people have a tendency of, of attacking, and Chuck was attacked, and they're attacking Jesus here, and it's because they won't hear his words. They refuse to listen. As plainly as he's speaking, they will not listen to him. And so what he does is he rebuts their unjust statements. In 1 Peter 2.23, the apostle said this, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So he said, I honor my father in what I say and all that I do. But you, verse 49, but you dishonor me. Now, on a certain level, the things that they're saying, they do have the uh, capacity of wounding. And their unbelief and their attacks and accusations have a wounding effect. Psalm 69, verses 7 through 9, reads, it like this, reads like this. Because for your sake, I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I've become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. And that's what is taking place here. And he's saying, in your dishonoring of me, the fact is you're dishonoring my father. In John 5, 23, he had said, all should honor the son just as they honor the father. And he who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. He says in verse 50, I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. So Jesus didn't come to seek his own glory, but to bring glory to his father. And the glory he brought to his father was related to redemption. You see, in yielding himself up as a sacrifice, he satisfied his father's righteous commands. He also paid the ultimate price. He appeased his father's wrath, and he provided salvation for those who would follow him. So when I say you do not honor me, he's saying, ultimately, I'm not seeking glory from you. You see, my father's the judge, and my father is the one who will glorify me. Uh, one of the things, again, that we remember as believers in Christ and as followers of him is that we don't seek glory from man. If you do, if you're seeking glory from man, that's the wrong thing to seek. What you want to hear is the well done from the Lord. Because when you seek glory from man, you'll have a tendency of changing things to make it more appealing to people. You might modify what you're saying. And, and, and Jesus didn't do that. He spoke, and we've seen this. He spoke very upfront, and, and so did his apostles. You know, the people didn't want to hear it. They wanted, you know, him to stop speaking the way that he did. I was sharing with somebody just the other day when God called Jeremiah. He said, do not be afraid of their faces. And it's not because they were so ugly. He was saying, because when you speak to people, especially in, 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 in groups, because you can be intimidated by them. You can be intimidated by the way they look at you and their body language and the things that they may even whisper to one another. You can see it. You know, you're looking at one person right now, but I look at a group of people. And sometimes there'll be people on over in one place or over in another. And I am telling you, you know, you're sharing something, you know, and, and they're not resp responding with a smile. You know, they're, they're scowling at you angrily. And I tell Marie, honey, don't do that in church. People are watching you. It makes me look bad. I mean, I told you it wasn't that long ago that somebody from church uh, yelled out and called me a liar while I was teaching. They do that. I had some, I, I can't even tell you some of the things that have happened in the church. I, I was going to tell you something, and I thought, probably shouldn't tell you. Well, I'll tell you it in a delicate way. I had somebody get up and give me the California howdy while I was teaching. Yeah. I, 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 if you know what that is, if you don't, ask your mom. <laughs> okay, you know, I, uh, this sounds self-serving. I'm trying to make a point. Forgive me. But I, I know I've given over 8,000 Bible studies. 
That's a lot of Bible studies to stand up at least 8,000 times. It's a lot of Bible studies. And there's a lot of faces and a lot of responses that I've seen over the years. And if you're afraid of how they're going to respond, you have no place in ministry. Because you have to think the one that you want to respond is in heaven, Jesus. And you want to hear the well done. And the most important thing, guys, always remember this. Speak the truth. Speak it in love. But again, have I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. I memorized that one over 40 years ago. Because I was raised by a mother who was very plain speaking. You always knew where you stood with my mom. Anybody here who knows my mom or remembers her? She was a plain speaking woman. She raised me. And so I'm a plain speaker. I don't know that it's insulting sometimes. I don't, honestly don't. I don't know that sometimes it may be harsh. I don't realize that. I just think it's true, right? So over the years, God gave me a beautiful woman who said, be nice. And it's helped me because I thought I was. I thought the best thing I could do is tell you the truth. I thought the church wants to hear truth, doesn't it? I did. I didn't want to hear some evangelist tell me how nice I am and I'm going to have the greatest day I've ever had. I, I, I didn't need that. I already knew I was a, a miserable lying thief. I already knew I was a doper and a drunk, and that I was everything evil. I knew that already. So some guy coming up and telling me, no, you're, you're wonderful just the way you are. That guy's nuts. He doesn't know me. And I really felt that. So when they said, you're a sinner, you're lost, you're going to go to hell, but Jesus Christ loved you and died on the cross for you, and he'll change your life and forgive you of your sins, that's the gospel. I needed to hear that message. Not that I'm good, but that he's good. And that's how it works. And don't be afraid. I'm, not, I'm really not one of these guys who's afraid. Why? Because my fear is of the Lord, not men. And that's why Jeremiah said, God said, don't be afraid of their faces. Tell them what I told you, and they're not going to like it. And you're going to get kind of tired of it after a while, and you're going to go through some things that you wish you didn't go through. But I called you to this because they need to hear truth. Do it with love, love for God and love for people, but always tell the truth. And what happened here is they were not responding well to it. And so he said, I'm not, I'm not seeking glory from you. In verse 51, most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. What do you mean he shall never see death? Well, believers in Jesus presently possess spiritual life because we're born again. And because we have new life in Christ, we live in fellowship with his father. We know that God is the author of life. And though our body will perish, our spirit never does. So in this way, for the believer, there cannot be death that lasts forever or eternally. In John 11, we'll see this in a while, verses 25 and 26, where Jesus is speaking. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then the question is asked, do you believe this? Now, what we think of as death in Scripture is really portrayed as sleep. It's not that our soul sleeps. There's no such thing as soul sleep. But it's that our body appears to be asleep. You see that in chapter 11 of John, how Jesus speaks of the death of Lazarus. When Lazarus died, Jesus spoke of him as being asleep. In John 11, verse 11, he said, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Well, when Jesus said this, his men said, Well, Lord, if he's sleeping, he'll get well. They thought Lazarus was resting and recovering, but Jesus corrects them in John eleven fourteen. 14. He said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, sometimes people think of death as a friend. The Bible doesn't call death a friend. The Bible says it's an enemy. In 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So in Christ, believers live, and death has no victory over us 
In 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So death has been swallowed up in life. Physical death is thought of in its true sense as entering into life. And life comes by abiding in the word that Jesus gives, and it's his word that preserves us from judgment. In John 5, 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And that's the kind of stuff that I like to, to read to you. When I first got saved, I would tell my friends, oh, I hope I go to heaven. I hope I go to heaven. Because I've been raised to believe that you can't know that that only self-righteous people would ever say they're going to heaven. And it took a long time in the first several weeks of my walk with the Lord for my friends to finally show me enough scripture to say, no, you passed from death into life. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. It's not something you try to get by earning and working for. It's something you receive by faith through Jesus Christ. And Jesus forgave you of all of your sins and cleansed you from all unrighteousness. And his Holy Spirit dwells within you. And your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And one day he's going to call you and say, come up here. And you're going to leave this place and be in his presence immediately. Where there is no, and no death. There's no fear. There's no tears. There's no sorrow. There's nothing but joy. That's what you have through Jesus Christ, you see. And that was what really changed my life is the knowledge that it's not works of righteousness, which I've done, but according to his mercy, he saved me by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what Jesus is speaking about. And so that's powerful what he just said. So how do they respond? Well, verse 52, now we know you have a demon. Isn't that sweet? Abraham's dead and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who's dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Well, that's pretty direct, isn't it? Now, again, remember who's saying this, those Jews who believed him. But they're being exposed right now for their real lack of faith, not true faith. Now, Abraham, they're saying Abraham and the prophets heard the word of God, yet they're dead. If God's word keeps you from dying, then how is it that they died? You've got to be crazy. And then in verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham, who's dead? The prophets are also dead. In other words, death comes to all men. No matter what they believe, even the greatest men die. Psalm 89, 48 says, what man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? So who do you think you are anyway? And so Jesus responds in verse 54, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he's your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. The Jews said, you're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Verse 54, it's my father who honors me, and it's his honor that matters most. And, and my father is the one, by the way, that you call your God. And that, this is because he is the God of Israel. So you automatically call him your God. But he's not your God because your actions are canceling out your words. In verse 55, he says, uh, you, you have not known him, but I know him. Uh, they don't know God on the basis of their rejection of his word. And in his proof that he knows God is that he says, I know him and keep his word which is, by the way, proof that you know him also. 
In 1 John 2, 4 and 5, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we're in him. He says in verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it, was glad. It may mean that Abraham looked forward earnestly to the Messiah and his appearing. He may have had a spiritual revelation, by the way, when he was about to sacrifice his son Isaac. Remember how he'd gone to the mountain and was about to sacrifice his son. Genesis 22, 8 uh, reads, Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And so it may be that he got a revelation at that time. Well, in verse 57, the Jews said to him, You're not yet 50 years old. Now, that's interesting. We know that Luke 3.23 tells us that Jesus began his ministry at around 30. Why did they use the number 50? You're not yet 50. Because that would be the age where maturity began to blossom. Um, when you read your Bible, uh, the, uh, like when, with Timothy, when Paul's writing to Timothy, he says to, he says to them that uh, him, that he needs to live as an example to the believer. Why? Because... People did not receive deep knowledge from the young. And Timothy was a young man when Paul was writing to him. So he said, be thou an example to the believer in, in word and faith and conduct and, and gives to him a, a variety of things. We were in Israel and um, Chuck Smith, we were with Pastor Chuck and his son Chuck Jr., we were at a place called Shiloh. And when we were at Shiloh, Jr. opened up the book of Jeremiah. Junior is around my age, and I was in my 30s at this time. And I was standing next to some of the Jewish bus, bus drivers. And I heard one of them when he turned, and he said, that young man, what right does he have to open up the prophets? Because in the Jewish religion, the youth do not touch the prophets until they're of a certain age. So that, 2,000 years ago, is still today. That still mentality is still in Israel to this day. And so that's why they say you're not yet 50 years old. They're saying you don't have the maturity to even speak in the way that you are because we know that your ministry started earlier. And what this is is simply a contrast of your lifespan with the centuries that have passed since Abraham. But here's where I want to close with you because this is very important. And oh, oh I'm going to do it anyway because I didn't take you here last time. I can't stop again. Verse 58, very important verses, and I'm going to run through them. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, notice before Abraham was, I am. This is what is called the third I am statement. There are seven I am statements in God, the gospel of John. The first I am statement was John 635 when he said, I'm the bread of life. The second we saw in John 8, 12, when he said, I am the light of the world. But he is saying here, before Abraham was, I am. Now, I want to point this out and, de and develop it a bit with you. I want you to notice he is saying, I am. He is not saying, I have been, and he is not saying, I was. He is saying, I am. This is very important theology for you. If you ever speak to somebody who denies the Trinity, they will tell you that Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh. They will tell you that. The Jehovah's Witness organization, which I think all of us are familiar with, I'm certain we are, will come to your door and will tell you that. I have had those conversations with them. I've had the discussions concerning the deity of Christ. They have what is called the watchtower of the New World Translation, rather, the New World Translation of Scripture. And they will use what is called the New World Translation. They bring it. They used to use the King James. So when they've come in the early days of my ministry, when they would come to my door, I would say, you guys use the King James before you had the New World Translation. They said, yes. So I said, good. You recognized it and honored it at one time. Yes, we did. Okay, then I'm going to use the King James. And... Why did I do that? I, this, this is something that would, I could take a long time to talk to you, but I'm trying to gel it down to something very quick. They translate, they created 
a Greek tense that does not exist. And in the New World Translation, translate this, I have been, not I am. There is a version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint version. The word, the, the Septuagint version is related to the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. It's called the Septuagint. I went to the library, got out a Septuagint, opened it up to John 8.58. In John 8.58, in the Greek, when he says, I am, the word is ego emi, E-G-O-E-I-M-I, -E ego emi. You open up the Septuagint version of the Old Testament and you go to Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. And when the Lord is speaking to Moses, God said to Moses, I am who I am. You shall tell the children of Israel, I am has sent you. You open that up in the Septuagint, ego emi. The Old Testament repeated in the New Testament. People will say Jesus never claimed to be God. He just did. He just did. Before Abraham was, I am. Taken right out of Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, and saying, I am the all-existing, ever-existing one. In Scripture, Jesus is revealed as God in the flesh. We've seen it in John. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. John 1, 14. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. John 5, 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. John 10, 30. The Father and I are one. That's not They'll tell you, oh, one in agreement. No, that word one in the original language speaks of one of in essence, not of purpose, but in essence. He is saying we are of the same essence. He's claiming to be God in the flesh. In John 20, 27 and 28, Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it in my side, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and what? My God. Well, I spoke to a Jehovah's Witness. I pointed this out to him. I said, Thomas. Called him my Lord and my God. Well, that's because he was surprised. That's their answer. Well, that, that's, he was shocked. Oh my, oh, my God. I said, no, no, wait a minute. I said, you know, would you say that Jesus is a rabbi? And they said, well, of course he's a rabbi. Okay, if Jesus is a rabbi, what does a rabbi do when someone theologically is incorrect? They correct him. But what does Jesus go on to say? You guys know what he's, he went on to say. You, you believe because you see, blessed is he who doesn't see and yet believes. I said, instead of bringing a rebuke, he gave him a blessing. And he gave us that same blessing. Does the Bible say that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, though he was God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Who being, being ever existing, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. They understood what he was saying, and it became the charge that led to his death. In John 19, 7, the Jews answered him, We have a law. According to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Their response, verse 59, they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out. They immediately desired to enact capital punishment for the sin of blasphemy. Under Jewish law, Capital punishment was enacted against adultery, murder, incest, sodomy, rape, witchcraft, disobedience to parents. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Preaching false doctrine, blasphemy. They understood what Jesus was saying. They desired to kill him. He stated he's God. In John 10, 33, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work, we do not stone you but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself 
God. Did Jesus ever say he's God in the flesh? Yes. Did it lead to the charge that had him placed on a cross? Absolutely. Yes, he claimed to be God. So they're collecting their stones. And Jesus blends in with the crowd and he leaves. And that reminds me of what he did in the city of Nazareth, by the way. He had spoken in their synagogue and they didn't like what he said. And they took him to the brow of a, of a cliff and they wanted to push him off. But Luke 4.30 says, passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Why? Because it was not his time to die. 